curator of the show, and she also curated the uh, art fair and carnival. So she's quite an awesome person. I just want to give you a little bit of applause for everything you've done. Yeah. So after a, a long day at the carnival, she is going to talk to you a little bit about the show. Do you want the sound? Yeah, I'm going to turn the Okay, but imagine it. <laughs> so Laura's on uh, the board of the Slide and Gallery, and we have uh, a board of about eight people. One of the mandates of the board is that everyone has to be responsible for curating a show. So this is what Laura came up with, and she usually comes up with an idea every month. So I only allow like one or two a year. So <laughs> there you go. So okay, thanks. <laughs> Well, thank you for coming because it was a really long day, so I appreciate everyone. I wasn't sure if anyone actually came tonight, but it was great. You're alone. So, um, yeah, so um, this is a show about consumption and specifically how it affects with pop culture. And so um, the idea for this kind of came about actually because of the carnival. So we knew we were going to have this carnival and I wanted to kind of do something like uh, related in a certain way. I knew it wouldn't be kind of a sort of thing allowed or anything before. Yes, and it comes to me. But something that connected to the carnival in, in, um, in a certain way. And so usually when I'm kind of thinking about an art project or anything to curate, it's something that interests me at the time that I'm thinking a lot about. And so I think about consumption a lot and mostly kind of environmental consumption in this day and age, you know, but um, when I was looking for art that talked about consumption, what I found um, that was really interesting were artists that were working with pop culture seemed to kind of be able to talk about it in a, in a more interesting way to me, and so that's kind of how the idea for this came about. Um, so I'm just going to kind of take you through all the works, and then at the end, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Um, so we'll start with Rory. So over here, um, Rory's a painter from Ottawa, and he... Um, he paints mostly in oils, but he also does watercolor. And so his watercolor actually kind of translates to an oil painting to me. Like it's very thick um, and kind of a very interesting, uh, yeah, use of watercolor. Like I don't think I've ever actually seen a watercolor quite <laughs> like this before. Um, but what I was really interested in about Roy's work is that he talks a lot about gender scripts. And so um, in this kind of series that we have in here today. Uh, a lot of it is about how pop culture determines uh, gender and how uh, it kind of dictates how uh, we perceive masculinity, especially. And so this um, painting is called When You Wish Upon a Star. <laughs> and um, so that's Michael Jordan <laughs> in the, the painting. And then this is, this is just kind of his like, stand and He has a whole bunch of paintings with the stand in of this child. And it could be any child. Like the idea is that it's any child in the Western world, basically. And, um, so his whole idea is he's kind of questioning the hero and how hero worship uh, is really dictated by consumerism more than actual kind of um, independent thought <laughs> process, especially with children. So um, this is kind of one part owed to Michael Jordan, who obviously was a huge uh, icon from <laughs> my childhood for sure, but uh, Roy and I are the same age, so <laughs> yeah, same, but also... Um, yeah, he's also done Wayne Gretzky's name in the clouds over there. I don't know if you saw that. So it's Wayne Gretzky's signature in a rainbow in the clouds. And so he's kind of, he's really kind of playing on that idea that the icon is someone that we think of as God and someone that we think of as like uh, indestructible and kind of holier than thou. And, and it's so kind of absurd in a way that it really kind of brings on that idea that, um, you know, this kind of mass cultural... Uh, worship of any kind of icon, or how much are we worshiping, and how much are we, we being told that we should just worship this person? So, um, I find his his work really clever and kind of uh, fun to look at. Um, and I'll just take you over here before we go on to the next artist. So, uh, the one just behind John <laughs> uh, is called In the Bro Zone. So he he did a whole series of um, moments. He would go through his favorite movies uh, from childhood and pick the scenes and then that he felt demonstrated kind of the most like the apex of uh, like masculinity basically in the movie. So he has he has one from Predator and they're just like they have like this high five handshake with like bulging vein muscles and then this is does anyone know like Germany, Germany. Yeah, Germany. Germany. Yeah. Germany. yeah. So um yeah. <laughs> yeah so he found this conversation in the movie especially like uh, like they're kind of they're both kind of at each other and, and um, in heated tones and kind of this kind of uh, 
yeah, escalation of the scene comes with, so he just kind of froze it, and um, his other ones actually sold, or else he would have brought them, because they're really great in the series, but I just recommend if you can go on his website, roydean.com, to see more of his work, because it's, it's amazing when you see it all together, and uh, kind of puts it into context a bit more. Um, and then the last piece that he has on the show is just right over here, and this is kind of talking, the reason I really wanted to include this one is because it talks a lot about um, kind of the um, the effects of having these hero and uh, hero icons um, that kind of demonstrate West, Western notions of masculinity and the effect on him today. And so this is called desktop, like I'm 16, but I'm actually 32. And so he's he's really like it's a beautiful painting. Like if we just look at this as a as a painting in itself, I find it really compelling. But at the same time, it's it's quite um it's not as I don't find it as uh, as funny as his other works, I find it a little bit more touching. Um, and there is kind of, it throughout a lot of his works, there is a bit of a dark undertone that kind of goes uh, along. And what he's kind of saying here is that because of the way pop culture di uh, dictates our, our behaviors and our gender codes, can we really ever kind of leave that idea and can we ever grow up? So that's kind of what he's talking about here. But. Yeah, but I still think it's a clever title <laughs> and pretty funny. So, <laughs> so Laura, sorry to interrupt, but yeah. how did you first uh, discover this artist? Um, he's in Ottawa. Yeah, he's in Ottawa. So, uh, two ways. It was it kind of came together in a weird way. The internet <laughs> was one way, um, and then I was just I grew up in Ottawa, so I was talking to friends uh, about the show, and and someone had remembered him from actually when we were. 16. Like we, yeah, so like she remembered an artwork, seeing an artwork of his and told me to check it out. Yeah, yeah but I've seen him, he's kind of, um, like he is on a few blogs and stuff, so I've seen like art blogs, you know, so okay. that's kind of how I, yeah. yeah. But he was great, like I, I was like, hey, where are you? <laughs> you don't <laughs> so know me, but like, but you just I didn't know him, yeah, yeah, and he was really into it, yeah, so mm -hmm. he was, yeah, he was great. Um, yeah, so maybe we'll walk over to uh, this video. <laughs> uh, so this is Mo's, um, she's from Montreal, and her art is really, um, she combines her drawings and her video a lot, and so this is, uh, <laughs> this time in the video is kind of grotesque, so <laughs> it's, um, but anyway, she's talking uh, in both of her videos, and most of her video art, what she talks about is um, the pressure of kind of modern day, uh, <laughs> I can't even sorry, <laughs> get distracted. Um, kind of the idea of mass consumerism and how, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> we're gonna walk over here because I can't see the, all I can see is a mouth with food hanging <laughs> which is like the reaction I'm supposed to have, but I don't know. Anyway, so this is about mass produced food and basically how corporations are making these decisions for us and how we consume, you know, she's, she's arguing that food has become part of popular culture. And in this video, she starts by kind of caressing the food that she's about to eat and kind of uh, showing affection for it, but then she kind of gets entangled within this moment of um, absurdity, but also, uh, you know, doubt about what she's eating. And so she speaks a lot in this video to kind of um, the decisions that are made uh, that are in many ways dictated kind of by pop culture that we don't even think about in our daily lives and that we, can, we literally consume them. So, yeah, it gets it gets pretty interesting. So we'll just go over this one because <laughs> it makes me laugh. So it is absurd, obviously. But, uh, so this one um, is a really interesting one uh, that I found that I didn't I didn't really realize what she was talking about until I watched it a few times. But um, a lot of her work kind of verges on the idea of uh, what's valuable, what's not valuable, and uh, things that are real and things that are invisible that are kind of dictated by popular culture, and so this is actually a piece about uh, the intimacies of our daily life and how even those things are now becoming uh, mass marketed, so this is actually about online dating. And so uh, she kind of goes through on one end, there's someone that could be on the other side of a, a computer screen, basically, that you're talking to, but on the other side, this is the end of it, so it kind of comes together at the end, but the other kind of uh, channel on this video is uh, taking us through this kind of like um, almost dreamy, but kind of eerie landscape, and it goes between day and night. And what those things are kind of playing on are um, both kind of these good things that could come from meeting someone online, but also the possibility that things could go horribly awry. So, um, so that is what this video is about. And I think that her work is really interesting because when uh, you talk to her about her ideas, she's actually very political and really, um, uh, yeah, quite. Um, 
she has strong opinions, but her art translates in this very kind of meditative, uh, yeah, a meditative kind of calmness. <laughs> so it's interesting. But she is um, speaking a lot about things that we all kind of interact with now almost every day. Right? So yeah, um, and then I think we will take a walk over to you. <laughs> hey. Mm -hmm. hey. <laughs> okay. So, um, uh, okay, so we're at the sculptural part of this uh, show. So these are Tamaya. Is Tamaya here? Hi. Tamaya, Tamaya's here. <laughs> so this is Tamaya, and um, these are sculptures. Do you guys obviously probably know what they're like? More drink cooking messages. And so, um, what really, what I found kind of remarkable, like we think of. Uh, the messages in a fortune cookie, they're kind of disposable and really kind of, um, you know, pretty commonplace. We're all used, we all know what they mean, or not what they mean, but what, um, what they are, and we're used to seeing them. But she's kind of, uh, she's made these out of porcelain, which is an incredibly fragile material, and so she's kind of highlighted, to me anyway, um, the fragility of these, these kind of iconic uh, things in our culture that are brought in from somewhere else, yet we're consuming them at the same time. So they're speaking to kind of this um, this idea and this notion uh, of disposal of culture and how how cultures can kind of quickly change and we can forget about the importance of where or the significance of where these ideas come from. Do you want to say anything else? But you can talk to her after. She's awesome. But yeah, I love her work. And um, we have a she did a giant 18 foot fortune cookie message and it didn't fit in the gallery. <laughs> but it's in our closet. <laughs> so if you want to see photos after you should check it out because it's amazing. Like it's this huge fortune cookie message. It's also kind of like reinforces the same idea on a different scale. So yeah. And I like the idea also about the fact that it's something that we consume kind of literally and figuratively and um, talking about food again. So yeah. And then um, coming over here we have beautiful Tegan's work and Tegan is here from Vancouver tonight. <laughs> Um, so, if you looked at this, could you tell what is projected on Tegan's body? Without, like, if you if you haven't, if we haven't talked about what it is. So this is actually street art that she's taken photos of, and they're projected on her body. Um, and so, what I find really powerful about this is that it's, um, she's talking about another kind of idea in popular culture, and that's the idea of uh, the artist and how all of us have creativity, and how even if we're not, you know, in a gallery. Um, there are all artists all, everywhere and all around us, and these are artists that we often take for granted and that have powerful stories and reasons for making art, and so those artists are also kind of intrinsically linked to place, and so when we walk, you know, it's kind of all about the power of story space and um, the layers of narrative that live within a landscape that we walk through every day and that we don't notice and we don't know about, and what I thought was so interesting about this is that I live pretty much downtown and every day when I'm walking, uh, there's something being destructed and no one seems to care and, um, you know, it is, yeah, we are living in a Western society, but uh, we think about how we consume culture and how we consume um, places that we that we inhabit and how precious those things are. And Tegan's kind of illuminated this idea that uh, there are so many things we can't see that are dictated by culture and that are informed by culture, and that when we erase them, what's left? Yeah. So, do you want to add anything to? <laughs> um, well, sure. Like when uh, when we were talking about the work and you were going picking the pieces for the show, yeah. I I think you had mentioned it, or we had a little chat about the intimacy too, of yeah. how the like big graffiti on such a big scale on the raw walls in the middle of the city, like dirty alleys and like you know forgotten places. And then here, this is the most like intimate self, like yeah. the, the naked skin, the vulnerability, the delicateness, and that translation of like whether it's consuming or, or like bringing in yeah. the city to the the personal space. Yeah, like, yeah. That too. But, uh, yeah. And I find um, I really love Tamaya's work with Tegan's because I find they're both really intimate, like the. Um, you have to kind of walk around, and you feel like you're kind of encroaching on these really precious things, and then you're walking over to Tegan, and you see, like, you know, like, a very kind of, very close <laughs> uh, personal space, and so, um, yeah, I think we were close together. Um, okay, then we'll move on to Ben, and do you guys know who, 
some people thought it was Kiss. <laughs> so I just wanted to, it's Molly Crew. Um, and so I was obviously like, I grew up in the 80s, so I obviously immediately was like, you know, and I grew up in definitely a dude household. <laughs> yeah, Molly Crew is a big part of it. Uh, but, so the, this painting, then this one, and the one behind us here is also done. And Ben's here. And Ben's here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Ben was in Berlin when I contacted him. Like, yeah. Like, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I really appreciate this. So, yeah. And was like, sure. Yeah, anyway. So, um, yeah. So this is quite different than the other works I've seen of Ben's. And I, I really, um, maybe I'll turn that down. <laughs> um, yeah, what I really found interesting is all these images are quite iconic. Like, even, I was talking to some people who are students here who are a bit older than me, and they didn't uh, obviously follow Motley Crue, uh, but they knew these images. Like, they knew it's such a kind of part of our cultural consciousness. Um, and they said, like, I don't know who they are, but I know where they're from. Like, that was something that someone said to me, and I was like, that's really true, right? Like, we have, this is Phoebe Cates from Fast, Fast Times at Ridgemont High, and that's kind of this iconic scene from the movie. And it's been distorted, obviously. Um, but people recognize this as something that comes from our Western popular culture, for sure. Um, and so what I found really interesting about this is I was reading about how like, there's a theory <laughs> that um, we don't really remember much anymore. We remember the images that were fed, and so in popular culture. And so I thought this was a really interesting way of like, this is something that is obviously, um, you know, iconic to so many people from my generation, but other generations too. We have this distortion happening, and that to me speaks a lot about like memory and trying to look back on something. And uh, the distortion also kind of makes you question what you're looking at and why you find it important. So that's what I found really strong about this piece, especially. And then when you look at Phoebe Cates, um, she's been totally <laughs> extended, you know. Um, and same thing. It's very uh, the other thing. Same. I don't know. Same. So you know, last night we were talking about how in history, like the, the way that the female nude has been depicted in art, we look at it now as something that's so elegant and, and kind of held on a pedestal, but many of uh, many works that, that had female nude in them were controversial at the time. And so in many ways they're kind of following this this uh, tradition in art. Um, but instead of having, you know, someone pose, we have these images that were fed every day. And I also think it talks a lot about how um, how pop culture started long before we we think of it starting. You know, like if if the idea of female nude in, in pop culture comes from so long ago, and that's you know, it, it's he's playing with that kind of tradition. You know? So yeah, Ben, you want to say anything? <laughs> that was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> the Molly thing is funny to me because I remember being eight years old and thinking I was I was like never grow up in a market dress like this. Yeah. <laughs> Well, also has his Motley Crue shirt from grade four. Yeah, <laughs> he's not wearing it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, and then I'm gonna have to restart the DVD. It's been playing all day, and it just went off. <laughs> so, in a moment, you will see a new image. Um, I thought it would be good to segue Ben's work into Jenny. And so, Jenny is Jenny Sharap. She's an artist from San Francisco. Um, and again, this is someone I really loved on the internet, <laughs> and then I just contacted and she re like, I really didn't expect her to get back to the wall, and uh, she does a lot of large scale paintings dealing with, uh, she's from California, she was born and raised in Los Angeles, and she happens to be blonde, so her whole life she's been dealt the stigma of the blonde girl from California. Um, and she, she's found that going through art school, uh, you know, that kept coming up, and so she decided to really exploit it in her work, like that's how she kind of describes it, like really just delving into it. Um, but what it kind of does is then it ends up questioning the role of the female artist, and the role of the media has played in kind of shaping um, the female in art and the female artist. So um, this video over here is called Rachel Zoe's California Song. And so the images, the kaleidoscopic images, are actually her artworks that she's superimposed onto this video. Uh, but what she did is she took an interview with someone, a, a fashion stylist. So like this, already we have this stigma of like, obviously it's a California girl, she's in a fashion. <laughs> um, and she's in an interview and all they're asking her is what she had for breakfast and lunch and what she likes to eat. And this is someone who, you know, has had like 30 years experience in her field and that's still all they want to know. 
So she's kind of playing with that idea and trying to get us to kind of, um, she's repeating a lot of things in the interview to kind of drive that point home. But, you know, how do we, how, how are kind of our, um, our opinions of women in art, but also blonde women are uh, shaped by how the media kind of expects us to react. So that's a big part. So this, this one is called Perfect Form. And so she's just taken someone, a woman, <laughs> who can do the splits and technically perfect form, but also uh, Ames chairs, which were huge kind of, uh, they were considered the perfect chair, you know, in the movie. And she's super, I think it's actually really, a really, really well done video. Um, but just kind of superimposing and think of how, how these ideas are constructed and so how the female body is constructed and also how, um, how it's constructed by the media. <laughs> and then the last one we have is, um, did, did anyone know? Probably who this is in the kaleidoscope. Pamela Anderson. Oh, wow. <laughs> in the kaleidoscope, yeah. So she just tends to, she uses the kaleidoscope a lot to play with perspective and the idea of like a fractured perspective giving you light into an idea. Um, and even though this is in many ways looking like it's kind of isolating these like preposterous kind of absurd things, what she actually does with the kaleidoscope, she's trying to bring a new conversation into ideas. Like this is someone who's an actress, but she's also a human. <laughs> um, you know, how do we, if we don't know it's Pamela Anderson, what do we think of this? And what do we think of the person who's acting in this class? So, um, yeah, and then the last one that I'll have to restart again is, uh, it's called Agnes Bar Martin. Did you guys pick up on Agnes Martin? So it's this woman, she's taken from an infomercial trying to stretch her smile and perfect herself. And then she has an interview with Agnes Martin playing over top of that, talking about authenticity. And so, um, and it is, it's actually really interesting because uh, Agnes Martin isn't someone you would ever associate with a California girl. Um, but she's talking about art, and then we're seeing this person who's trying to turn her face into a work of art and just draw connections between those two things. So, yeah, so. Um, and yeah. Laura's the first curator to create a beach in the gallery. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Do you want to speak a little bit about the beach? Yeah, so the beach, um, so Jenny, her work, like obviously because she's in California, she couldn't ship in her paintings or her things like that, but video is really accessible, so she was able to get that to me. And she was like, you know, she wanted her installation to kind of reflect the other installations that she she does where she lives. So um, she really goes all out. Like I also recommend checking out her website because she has like extreme installations, but um, she just really tries to drive down that idea of the California female. And so she said, like, I was just talking to her, and like, within, like, 30 seconds, she's like, so, can you install a beach? <laughs> that was, like, all, she's like, I'll do the show, but can you install a beach? <laughs> so, she's like, do you have access to sand? And I just thought, like, yeah, of course, because we live in Victoria. <laughs> but it just did not come from the beach. <laughs> yes, it came from a garden. Like, oh. And it was delivered in a giant truck, <laughs> and it was wheelbarrowed, and, yeah. and like shoveled. Into, yeah. So, and the other thing is the exposed cords. Like, the, we really wanted to kind of draw attention to the fact that um, media and how we consume it. So the cord is like kind of referencing our our participation participation in that uh, consumptive act, but also the idea of the TV and the history of watching TV and TV in general, and how that shaped notions of femininity and media. Uh, was a big thing for her. She wanted. She didn't want flat screen TV. She wanted mm -hmm. TVs, and I think they do work with her. So no illusion. Yeah, no illusion. <laughs> yeah. So really, kind of. Yeah. And um, yeah, the other thing um, I just want to say is that all these works, like they do, they're very accessible, and I think that's uh, that's really interesting because they're talking about something. You know, they can get pretty dark. Consumption can be really like, especially in this day and age. You know, um, but they all the artists have this. The one thing that they share in common, I think, is that they all kind of know where the money is, you know? And um, I think we undermine humor <laughs> a lot, especially in art, and um, humor is a really kind of intelligent way of starting a conversation, and so I'm just really grateful everyone <laughs> uh, can participate, because I think everyone's work really does have a great sense of humor while kind of looking at something a lot bigger. So, yeah, thank you. Yes, welcome. Yeah. You didn't know what they I know. <laughs> 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 Yeah. This is the one I feel is especially like actually a lot of people are talking about this more than the other two events. I think that it's one of like a moment of frustration where I kind of got bored of looking at art in Victoria and I just thought it was a less sexist story. I 
picked a saucy, like, I guess it be a centerfold picture from the 70s, and I'm in the motorcycles. But I think this is the most, like, art historical. <laughs> like, really, because it's like talking about, like, this isn't, like, this could be anyone from any, like, image we've seen or any movie. Like, we don't know if it's an actress that we know or anything like that, but it's um, talking about the female nude in art and what the images that we're used to consuming. And so I think, like, down the line, this, this kind of image will be the type of image that is part of that kind of Western yeah. European. The only thing I thought of, too, too, is, like, I remember in, like, the 80s and stuff, this type of play where it was really considered bad and dirty. Yeah. And now, and it's, now. now compared to what's out there, this is like really classy. Yeah. Renaissance. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of full circle. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. So, yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.